Is it on video? We're good? You made it? Okay. Uh, okay, hello. Welcome to the video people to part three of this uh, class, the Restoration Celebration. If anybody forgot, that's what we're calling it. We are. And I started realizing how rad it is that, you know, it's 200 years since the first vision, which makes it a birthday party, essentially, for the first vision. So let's all just remember how fun that is. So um, this is cool. This is part three. Part one, we talked about the first truths of the restoration, which really were just the existence of God and what his heart is like. That's kind of like what was first unfolding. And I want you to remember, we talked about this last time, but uh, it, since the very beginning, it's never been about the establishment or a restoration of a church, but it's been about a restoration of people. And the whole story begins with a father uh, and his boy in the grove and the Savior there. Like this is where the whole story begins. And that's the heart and soul, like doctrinally and anything else about this. That it's just, a, it's about personal connection and relationship with God. That is, that's right from the beginning. And then next we talked about this, the covenant context of the restoration, that you can't miss this worldwide reaching out from the Father into the whole world and what his intentions are with the entire human family. And that's where you have to see the restoration in that covenant context. So if you missed any of those, you can go back and, and watch them or you can read the scriptures. That takes a lot longer. So you get to choose which route you want to take. <laughs> One hour or like years. So I'd pick an hour. We're in a microwave society. Why would you not? We have drive throughs for Coke now, swig places. So I'm just guessing people are going to pick that one. Uh, we're going to keep going with the story a little bit more today. We kind of ended on a, on a cliffhanger. Um, everything ends on a cliffhanger though, you know? Oh no, now I have to remember a new code. Okay, so I actually want to start today in the Old Testament because why should we not think about the fact that it's coming uh, in two years from now? We can't even wait. Should we just skip with Come Follow Me all the way to the Old Testament? I'm ready. I know we love the Book of Mormon. It's fine. We'll finish that. The Doctrine and Covenants is going to be fine too. Um, and then we'll get into this. This is such an awesome chapter. Um, it's uh, Genesis chapter 28. I think I'm going to see if I'm in the right spot. Yep, I'm right. Um, it's Genesis chapter 28. And this is a, uh, a man that a lot of you may know if you're familiar with the Old Testament, whose name is Jacob. His dad's name is Isaac and his grandpa's name is Abraham. And I think it's fun that one of the, the most famous titles for God in the Book of Mormon is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's something about this. There's something that we want to learn. There's something about him being the God of Israel. Um, remember, the Book of Mormon uses covenant um, shorthand language. It assumes you know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Israel's story when you read the book. There's like a prerequisite to the Book of Mormon. You know, it just starts. It's sort of random. I have a friend who is a, um, a member of another Christian faith. And when she read the Book of Mormon for the first time, she was like, it's so random. It just starts with this guy who's just talking, you know, like what is going on? And I was like, I know at least the Bible starts very nicely in the beginning. OK, there was a God and he started making things. And you're like, OK, OK, I see where this is going. The Book of Mormon just starts off with. Hi, <laughs> my name's Nephi. You don't know me, <laughs> but I've got good parents, you know, and you're just kind of like, Where, what is happening? What is the context? What country are we in? What time period are we in? Where are we? You know what I mean? It's just kind of a little bit nutty. Um, so it just assumes coming in from the very beginning. The Book of Mormon is not nutty. I just want to like make that as a statement for everybody. Thank you. Um, this, so it assumes you know these stories. So this, you know, you know you've know, got the story of Abraham, and it's just, um, every time I hear that phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I think to myself, what, what are they trying to say? What's the intention of that title? You know, um, the Lord has over a hundred names and titles throughout Scripture. And it's interesting to look at each one and think to yourself, what is that teaching me about Him? Like, what does it mean if you want to call him Shepherd or Shiloh? Or what does it mean if he wants to be Messiah or Christ 
or lamb or, you know, all of these different titles? What do they teach me about his nature and character? So what's the title God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why choose that one? Why are you, why are you trying to remind me of those people's stories, of, of anybody that is, that's there? Well, maybe part of it's this. Jacob was Isaac's son, and you remember, listen, I love Jacob, but he was a scoundrel. His name, Jacob, actually means supplanter or liar. Um, sometimes when you read scripture, you think that later writers gave people nicknames. I don't know if his real name is Jacob or not, or whether he was given a nickname later to match his personality. Because it's just kind of funny that he was a liar and a deceiver and supplanter, and he just happened to be named that. Be careful what you name your children, I guess. You know, I was like, I will name you obedient rich one. <laughs> And I will name, maybe you could do something like that. So what are the odds? I don't know. Maybe it's a nickname later. I'm not making any stance on that, but he really was. Now think about this for just a second. I know we try to like whitewash the story a little bit to feel a little bit better about him, but straight up he stole from his brother. His brother was hungry and he went in and he was just like, star I mean, only the men in the room can relate to this, <laughs> that you would give up something so valuable for a meal. You know, that's just how we work. And, and he does, he takes advantage of a hungry man. And you're like, that's not right. <laughs> like, you should not do that. And it gets worse. Then he tricks his father into get, he dresses up like his brother. He takes fur from an animal and puts it on his arm and tricks a blind man. If that is not a sin worthy of a lower kingdom, I don't know what is, you know? You can't trick blind people, y'all. Like that's like, I don't know if it's in the Ten Commandments, but it should be. Thou shalt not trick blind folks. Like that's just a new level of wrong. And so he leaves home, right? His brother wants to kill him. He's sort of got to be at odds with his dad. I don't know what that conversation's like. Like, eh, sorry, <laughs> you know? His mom tells him, run away. So he runs out and he's literally in the middle of nowhere. It says it, the scripture says, I'm not making that up. It says this, and he lighted upon a certain place. It has no name. <laughs> Y'all, I've driven through East Texas, okay? And I have been to some places <laughs> that don't even have stop signs, but they have names. This place has no name. <laughs> he comes to a certain place, a nameless place, and he decides he wants to sleep there. Why? Because the sun was set. There was no hotel or anything. The sun went down, so he's like, well, I guess I'll sleep here. He's penniless, friendless, sort of familyless, promised landless, uh, potential is there, but like prospectless, you know, and he's sort of in this like low place. And the scriptures like just to kind of jab at it a little, it says, and he took one of the stones out of that place and put them for his pillows to lay down in that place to sleep. Like this is rock bottom. <laughs> I'm a father of six. I'm allowed puns like that. Okay. <laughs> but he really is. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. He really hits, a, he's sleeping on rocks. Like he's hit in, in a desert, lonely, deserted place, right? And then something fascinating happens. It says he dreams this dream and a ladder is set up on the earth. Now ladders are used for what, friends? Going up, right? So this symbol comes, a ladder, right? A symbol of being able to move up. And he looks and the Lord, it says, stands above it in the King James translation. But if you click it, you can see or beside it. And I actually like that translation a little better. That the Lord stands right beside where he was with a ladder and then says this to him. I'm the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land whereon you liest, to thee I will give it to you and your seed. And your seed will be the dust of the earth. Do you recognize these promises? Right? If you were gone last time, these are the promises that he promised to Abraham and to Isaac. The promises that Moroni quotes to Joseph that can be the promises of the fathers planted in you. The promises of exaltation are being given to this boy right here in this place. When you almost would think to yourself, this is, you're undeserving of these is what some church folk might think. Right? You got to like brush up, apologize first. 
clean up, get to a better place in your life, and then these can be promised to you. But God meets him laying on the pillows in a desert place in a really low spot in his life and meets him in that place and starts to make these promises. And then it gets better. He says this, Behold, I am with you and will keep you. That word also means guard. I will guard you in all places wherever you go. And I will bring you again to this land. I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken of. There's that God we learned about last time who says, I'm not leaving your side until I fulfill all the promises that I made to you. Now, this is so surprising because Jacob would have woken up or maybe even at that moment and thought to himself, I cannot believe God would come to a place like this. Not this place. It's shocking that God would show up to a boy like him in a place like that. But you ought to get used to being surprised and shocked by God. If he's not amazing you, I don't think you're hearing the right story about him. If it's not shocking you, someone's not preaching good enough news, I think. But he meets him here in this place and it's like, whoa. And then, I mean, it's just this sweet scene, you know. And you can expect that same God to show up in your desert places, in your lonely places, with promises and with ladders and with a commitment to never leave your side also. That's who he is. That's who we're seeing, right? That's who's showing up in, in, in 1820, in 1830. The same God that's right here. The story keeps going and it's crazy. You know, seriously, it's crazy because then he goes to a well and meets a girl, kisses her on the first day and proposes on the first day. They, they, I know the certain place. It was Provo. I know where they were. I already named it, right? Then he like wants to marry this girl and like lust drives all his decisions and he's mean to this other girl and then they finally have all of these kids. You remember the story? I mean, it's just nutty. The story's crazy. Then they have all these kids and this one like, you know, has an affair with his mother-in-law and these two trick a whole city and kill all of them and then later they're going to sell their baby brother off to somebody else. Like, and you're kind of like, ha ha ha, here is the house of Israel. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're just like, this is, this, like when you read these stories to your kids at night, you have a really hard time telling them who the hero of the story is. Because you're like, you ought to be like, um, <laughs> Leah seems nice. <laughs> you only get a couple verses about her, you know? But in the midst of this, God gives Jacob a new name. He learns his lesson after a whole bunch of struggle. He finally, like years and years and years, he figures it out. And God gives him a new name. And the name that he gives him is Israel. Right? Which means one who prevails with God. He used to be the supplanter and the deceiver. And then he learns and become someone who prevails with God. That's his new name. So every time we say house of Israel, it, one, who's, one who prevails with God, that's just a nice way of saying grace. But that's a girl's name. So he didn't give it to him. <laughs> he gave him Israel instead. Whenever you identify as a house of Israel, you're identifying as the house of someone who needs God to prevail. That's, that's what you're saying every time. I'm, I'm a, I count myself a member of the house of Israel. Oh, what you're saying then is you count yourself as one who needs God's help in order to prevail. And you're like, yes. That's what I mean when I say that. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. All throughout Scripture, what's so fascinating and amazing to me about this kind, this kind of talk in Scripture, and sometimes we want to turn them you know, into heroes and into these great people, but I actually love them staying really messy and really faulty because then it leaves the hero space blank and open for God to be the hero of this story and of the restoration story and of mine. So, of course, you're going to expect that same pattern in this dispensation also. You're going to expect the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this God who makes impossible promises, this God who rescues 
and this God of second chances. This God who takes lonely, lying desert boys and turns them into into something great. That's the God that you're going to expect to show up. And that's the God that does show up and is moving and working through the restoration. I love the people of the restoration. I love their courage. I love reading stories about them. I love the people of the Book of Mormon. But I'll tell you when the Book of Mormon became powerful for me is when it stopped becoming a book about Nephi and Alma and Abinadi and it became a story about God and how all the things they did were because of him. They prevailed with him. There's a story of Israel, people who prevail with him. This is his. Let him be the hero of the Book of Mormon. Let him be the hero of the restoration story. And, and it's okay to like admire and love, and, and we do, but like I think that's super important because that's who, who comes. We notice that right away, right? Because Joseph's in his bedroom with Moroni, praying for forgiveness of sins, by the way. Remember, he's like, ah, oh, I really probably ought not use my fists to solve my problems. I should stop punching people, is maybe what he's thinking. And an angel shows up and you know, and, and he learns about the plates, right? And he's like, oh, okay, this is going to be great. And he knows exactly where to go. And the next day he's out working and collapses. And the angel's like, I told you to tell your dad and you haven't told him yet. He's like, well, I didn't think he'd believe me. And he's like, well, I told you he was going to believe you. And he's like, I know, but I'm 17, so I don't believe you. <laughs> and he's like, well, go try. And so he goes and he tries and his dad's like, it's of God. Like, you have to do it. And he goes to the hill. And remember the night before, Moroni warned him. You are going to be tempted to use the gold in that hill to help your family's poor situation because they are dirt poor. So I'm just warning you that you're going to be tempted. Don't give in to the temptation. And he's like, okay. It's a three-mile walk, friends, from Joseph's house to the hill Cumorah. By the time he got there, he had decided he was going to use the gold (laughs) to help out his poor family. So he, you know, he's like doing the lever business and he's like, oh my word, reaches in and gets shocked. <laughs> you remember? And he's like, whoa, that's weird. Again, he gets shocked. And he's like, why can't I get him? And, and Angel Moroni shows up and he's like, because like you broke the first rule. There was one and you broke it. And he's like, oh, and he's like, but you can try again. Come back next year. <laughs> and he's like, okay, right? One year later, he comes back and he's like, I'm ready. And Moroni's like, don't let these out of your sight ever. And he's like, okay. He picks them up, takes them out. And he's like, ooh, you know, and he sees like the other treasures that are in the box. He's just like, those look so fun. And he's like, oh, and they're gone. And he looks back and it's covered. And he's just like, (laughs) opens a little shot. And he's like, what? And he's like, you you let them out of your sight. That was like the, the only rule. You can come back next year. And he's like, okay. <laughs> the next year, you can come back next year. Right? This is the story, right? You see the same God showing up from Genesis 28 here. This one who's like, thank goodness he's not three strikes, you're out. Otherwise, one of you would be digging in Hilkomora right now. Right? It's just like, it's just, he's just like, but it's so awesome that he has sent for him this spiritual tutor who is going to help him learn help him develop his faith and trust in God, help him learn quick lessons of uh, repentance and, like, and distinguishing between like, you know, the, the devil and the Lord. Like someone's tutoring him through this whole thing. It's so messy and it gets messier, right? Finally, he gets them and it's just like a, it's a circus. It's a circus. They don't have enough money to get a box to put them in. Right. And so they're like trying, like hiding them places and trying to figure out how to get a box. And you know the story, right? Are you reading Saints right now? It's so good. Like if you haven't um, cracked those books open yet, maybe come back to the first Saints again. And the way they tell the story is just so money. I'll tell you why I really love it. Number one, it's just good. And it's a good like storyteller. I'm not going to tell the whole story right now. You got to, you know, you can go and read it and see it. And they do a really good job of telling the story. But what's so neat is um, one of the people who was in charge of the projects talked to me about this once. And he said, we tried, we called it saints because our whole theme in our mind writing it was Mosiah 319. That people through the grace and atonement of Christ can become saints. That it's a story of people becoming 
And I love that. It's that same. It's Israel's story. We're a people of, of becoming, right? Anyways, he finally gets some, you remember, and then they have to move down south because everybody's like chasing after him and they're hiding them in the fireplace and in the beans and with the sisters who are asleep and everyone's like, this is, and poor Emma is like, oh, what have I gotten myself into, you know? And it's like, oh, darling, you have no idea, right? And then they just, and finally they get to move down and Emma's dad doesn't like Joseph, you know, and then like finally they're kind of getting some friends, but no one can see them. And so everyone's kind of like, why can't we see him? That's a little bit weird. And he's like, I don't know, but I finally learned my lesson that when the angel gives me a rule, I now listen to the rule, you know, and then Martin's kind of helping. You remember this is whole story and it's just a mess and they're just bar in borrowed bedrooms. They don't, never have money for paper, but people show up with paper. And you're just like, thank you, and mackerel. Do you love when it says that? They came with paper and mackerel. You're like, what is a mackerel? It's a fish, right? And you're just like, thank you. So they're like eating fish and writing. It's like weird, right? And it's just this like, and you would find probably on the manuscripts, mackerel stains, you know? We're just like writing this and going through, and it's just, and they finish the 116 pages, and then, again, we have to have some more lessons. Because Martin, who's way older than Joseph, his only friend and believer, you know, outside of the family, is says, hey, if I could actually borrow these and show them to my wife, like she would, I think, stop bugging us. And I could give some more time and support to it. Okay, the Lord says no. He says no. Can you ask again? Okay, he says no. He says, can you ask again? And the Lord's like, do what you want. You know? And he's just like, okay. And they make this contract, you remember? And like... He takes them and Lucy's actually, um, Martin's wife is actually satisfied when she sees him. She's happy. Um, it's when he comes back to the house, they're locked up in her little burrow that she only has the key to. And when he shows them to somebody outside of the promised list of people he'd show them to, because they made a pact, I will only show them to the following people, right? And when he wants to show them to maybe he's a little tipsy on that day, wants to show them to someone outside the list, can't open up the burrow and breaks it. That's actually what makes her like a big enemy <laughs> of, of the work. It was not like, the, it was a lie. It's like, you broke my furniture. <laughs> Sister, it's okay, amen, right? You're just like, I was fine with it until you broke my favorite <laughs> piece of furniture in the house, right? And then she kind of, anyways, it's just the whole story. It's like, and that scene, oh, when you read it, just, just do it double time in Saints because it's so sad. When Joseph's there and Martin shows up like two hours late, it's kind of... Everyone knows what happened and no one's saying anything. And he sits down and slams the utensils down and Joseph's like, please don't tell me you lost that. The, the, their first baby had just died and Emma's like, you got to go. And he I mean, the whole thing is a mess. The whole thing's a mess, right? It is so crazy that those pages get produced, ever. Oliver shows up, right? And the whole thing, we just get the, at the end, the whole story is like, there's nothing clean and nice about it. Can't you imagine yourself thinking like several times throughout this, like, if this was God's work, wouldn't it be a little bit easier and a little bit cleaner and a little bit like nicer? And someone should say, like, no, have you not read anything <laughs> from the past? You know, once people get involved, it gets so messy, the whole story. And it's just a miracle that those pages even show up on the scene ever. Right? That is fascinating that they have something to go hand over to E.B. Grandin's shop to even give to them. And the rate that they do it. You know, you've read all this before, right? That you're just like, this is crazy it is wild that it even and they and they give you can see a copy of this printer's manuscript later it's just a copy of it it's not the real one but i'm really like pushing for, for brother moon to get the real one um i mean i just think it'd be fun you know it's not this it's kind of cheap um to get the second one but um, they, they take it over to the shop and you can come up and see these later. And then over here, if you look, there is a replica to E.B. Grandin's press. It's in this room over here. They used to be in, up in Palmyra and now it's here at this shop. Um, and the letters, have you seen the letters before? Have you like been to Nauvoo or wherever they do these things and show, like this is an O in case you don't know. 
you know, somebody putting these in upside down and backwards, you know, just the whole thing is just like, and they made what, a couple thousand mistakes in it and they're scatty wampus pages, you know, and it's just sort of like, oh, whoops, that's actually page 112, not 212, like, let's redo that one. And, you know, they're just like, it's just, but it's so fun, right? It just was a messy, messy experience, but I would bet there are people in this room who would say, but the end product is beautiful and it's changed my whole life. Like what God created out of that mess, he really brought gold out of the dirt. He really did. And, and this, this, this beautiful thing happened that was all part of it. I like this scripture that we can look at together from... Um, the words of Mosiah, that's, that's, I, I made that up. The words of Mormon. That's in the 116 pages because Brother Moon's got that back there. So I was just reading it before we, before we started. But, um, so I got a little confused. But um, the words of Mormon, you remember this is the spot in scripture where Mormon as the editor shows up after a couple of books. He doesn't live for several hundred years later, but all of a sudden he shows up as a writer, right? And he's like, hi, bet you're wondering why I'm here. <laughs> Um, I don't live for a couple hundred years, and I'm actually the guy who puts the whole thing together. But the Lord told me to put this extra section in here. I don't know why I'm doing it. Nephi did the same thing earlier. Remember, he's like, I feel like I got to write two records. I don't know why I just should, you know. And they, it's just so fun that the Lord's figured this out a long time ago. That someone's like, Joseph's like, I messed it up. And the Lord's like, uh, you're Israel. <laughs> you're going to prevail with me. Right? Don't worry. I've got this covered. But I love this line that, um, that uh, um, Mormon says. He says this. It's in verse something seven. And he says, I do this for a wise purpose. For thus it whispereth me according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord, which is in me. And now I don't know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore he worketh in me to do according to his will. And that seems to be what this story is all about. Is the Lord working in someone like me? Jacob out in the desert maybe thought, really? In this place? To a guy like me? And the Lord's like, yes. I actually do my best work in places like this and with people like you. And Joseph could have said after mistake number 18, really? You're still here? And he said, yes, I promised I wouldn't leave your side until I fulfilled all my promises. Yes, I do my best work with people like you. Messy situations. That's where I do my very best kind of work. And that's what this whole story is, you know, is this, this is the whole beautiful story is this, right? Now, they finally get the book printed, which is just awesome. And fantastic. But as it's getting close to being finished, you remember Martin kind of comes back. They sort of have a little spell of time after the pages are lost where they are kind of on an icy terms and aren't talking with each other for a little bit. And then this section, it's Doctrine and Covenants section five. Um, this is when Martin finally is back talking to Joseph for the first time again after losing the 116 pages. And listen to what is said here. Behold, I say unto you, as my servant Martin Harris has desired a witness at my hand, that you, my servant Joseph Smith, have got the plates of which you've testified and borne record of me. So he's come back and he said, now I know that I've been a part of this, but what I'd really like to do is see the plates. If I could actually see the plates. Now at this point, he's held the box where they're in and shifted them around, right, and moved them. Uh, several people have done that, but nobody except for Joseph has actually seen them. Yeah, a couple people have felt them on the table. You know, you would too if your job was to clean the table every day, accidentally like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said nothing about feeling them. <laughs> you know, so you love stories like that where people are like, okay, that's fun, right, and just cleaning around it. But he says, if I could just see them, you know, then... Maybe I could 
believe it. And I could give a little bit more money and time to this, you know. Don't you love Martin? He's my favorite of all the witnesses because he's just like, I just, I just identify with him. A little rough around the edges, you know. He's just like, well, I kind of believe. You know, I just, Jenny's a believer, you know. My Jenny, that I'm, that's my lady that I'm married to, she's just a straight believer. I'm the question asker. I'm the one who's just like, for real? Like, where, where, where is it? How do you know that, you know? Like, and Jenny's the believer. I'm the Martin in the family, right? And it's funny because the Lord says, oh, it's actually funny Martin should ask because I have a plan. I actually have a plan in what I'm going to do. And what he tells him is, actually, do you want to follow this, this little train of scripture real quick? Okay, start in Doctrine and Covenant 17.6, and here's his plan, his plan of witnesses. 17.6, it says this, for those who might not have scripture with them, and he, meaning Joseph, has translated the book, even that part which I commanded him, because there were other parts, right? And he says, and as your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. Okay, first witness of the Book of Mormon is actually who? Christ. Yeah, it is Christ himself. He's like, I will first bear my witness. Okay, now go back to section 5. I promise you're not jumping around a ton. Go back to section 5, verse 2. Oh, I just closed my scriptures. Okay, verse 2. And now behold this, I say unto him... He who spake unto you said unto you, I, the Lord, am God, and have given these things unto you, my servant Joseph Smith, and have commanded you that you should stand as a witness of these things. Witness number two is supposed to be Joseph Smith. You will be a witness of these plates to the world. Okay, then you go down a little bit, and verse 11, the Lord says, is all part of my plan. He says in verse 11, And in addition to your testimony, the testimony of three of my servants, whom I shall call and ordain, unto whom I will show these things, and they shall go forth with my words. Yea, they will know of a surety that these things are true, for from heaven will I declare it unto them. And I will give them power that they may behold and view these things as they are. Okay, and their names, do you remember their names? Martin, my guy Martin. David and Oliver, okay? Oliver we're going to come get to in a second because he just shows up in the story. Don't you love that? Like we're, we've run out of people to help subscribe the book and then it's like, hi, I don't know why I'm here. And you're like, I do, come in, <laughs> right? It's so fun. Don't you love this? It's so neat. When you watch the story of the people who come into the story, it's so fun. And we won't get to all of them, obviously, during this class, but saints will paint the picture for you, which is fun. Because do you remember Elder Maxwell saying that one time that the, saint, the star of Bethlehem that shone over Bethlehem the night Christ was born, that God put that star into orbits millennia before it ever shone on that night. Like all the planning that went into that, Elder Maxwell said, he has put at least equal attention into human orbits and these divine rendezvous, and you can like see it in the story like people just show up with the fish and the paper with the pen with like all, all the people it's just so fun to watch the lord do this at the end of the story you have to step back and say god did this that's what's so rad about the messiness of the story is at the end you're like the only hero in the story it's been left blank for one person it's god and remember, whenever anyone asks Joseph about translation, they're like, what, did it, what was it like? Other people, we get the story of the seer stones and the hat and you know, all the things. But when you ask Joseph, he was like, by the gift and power of God. Like, I, <laughs> Emma, when she gets interviewed later, how did, it, how did that happen? And she was like, it was God. I knew him better than everybody else. He could not put a sentence together. It was God. <laughs> Right? You have to tell the story. Like, it, the story demands that he's the hero of it. All throughout Scripture, it's the same. It's the same. Right? <laughs> Nobody tells the story of the Red Sea, and they're like, you know who the hero was? It was that, there was that fugitive from Egypt with the speech impediment. <laughs> he had a magic stick, and he opened the ocean. And you're like, false. God opened the ocean. Right? 
It leaves the spot open for him. The story is so fun. Don't be afraid of the messiness because it leaves the hero spot open and blank for God to do his best work in situations like this. What were we even talking about before that happened? I don't know. What was happening? Okay, the three witnesses. They're so fun. Okay, all the people come. Oh, yeah, because you said Oliver, and we just started talking about Oliver. Okay, and then... It says in 15, the testimony of three witnesses will I, will I send forth of my word. And behold, verse 16, here's the next part of the plan. Whoever believes on my word, them will I visit with the manifestation of my spirit. And verse 18, and their testimony shall go forth into the world also. And there's another level of that plan. The three witnesses. I will be a witness. Joseph will be a witness. These wit- the three witnesses will be witnesses. And then whoever believes the words of the book, they then become a witness of it. Which is, which is beautiful because you and I just got roped into it. And, and just remember, FYI, you can be a, a liar, supplanter, deceiver <laughs> and still be a part of this. One of the reasons I love Martin. Now you remember this. Let's talk about some of these fun things real quick. Because it's so cool. Well, up here, what you're going to see when you come is right here is uh, section 11 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, you remember this section? Hiram goes to Joseph and he says, hey, I want to help. Hiram's the only one not messy in the whole story, just so you know. <laughs> Everyone else is messy except Hiram. If Jesus is unavailable on Judgment Day, you pick Hiram. <laughs> He just was a sweet soul, okay? You just pick him. So he goes to Joseph and he says, hey, I, 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 I want to be a part of this. Can I, can I be some part of this somehow? And the Lord gives him an answer, and it's so awesome because for a long time nobody knew where it was, but it's right here. This is the original section 11 of the Doctrine and Covenants written in Hiram Smith's handwriting. As Joseph's dictating it to him, he's just writing it. And your favorite verse is when he says, my son Hiram, and he gets to write that down. You know, so cool. Right here is original copy of the Book of Mormon. I almost said fresh off the press, but that is now 200 years off the press. Okay, then you can't wait for this. This is Hiram's first edition copy of the Book of Mormon right here. This is Joseph Smith's copy of the Book of Mormon right here. This is Samuel Smith, baby Sam, little brother Samuel, the three brothers. You know, this is his copy of the Book of Mormon. And you wish you could see in this one. Oh, it's open. You can't wait. Okay. Hiram's one of the eight witnesses. Samuel's one of the eight witnesses. Don't worry. Be so careful. This is John Whitmer's copy of the Book of Mormon. He's one of the eight witnesses. And inside are his little pencil notes he wrote in the margin as he studied the book. Like these are people who actually, Martin Harris's cane is just right around the corner here. You know, it's, it's, it's just like, what? Hold on. These are folks who like actually saw some of them, handled the plates, moved them like this. You know, three of them heard the voice of God bear witness that they were true. Like these, and these are their like, and you love when you like, oh, they hand them off to, because they start handing them out to people. It's like, I've, don't you love that pattern? First you, then the three, then to the world. This is so cute when you come see this one. Samuel's copy of the Book of Mormon. It's got the, cop, the list of the eight witnesses and their testimony. And he put a little star next to his name. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> No, for real. I'm like, I saw him. I saw him. This is me. You know? And their stories are, are so neat. Because all of you remember, it's like learning the stories, kind of getting involved. And he has that moment where he says, for real? Like, this story's almost too good to be true. And someone should have, like, the narrator of the story that needs to have their voice come over, you know, and say, that's true, Oliver. Someone's not telling the story right if it's not too good to be true. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to shock you. He's like, really? Really? 
And you remember the Lord says, and then Oliver talks to Father Smith about it, and he's like, well, you should pray about it and find out. He's like, okay. So he prays and tells no one else about the prayer. Then he goes and meets Joseph and asks Joseph, could you ask the Lord for like a, a revelation for me? Because he sees all these folks coming and getting, sure, the wor- uh, you know, marvelous work is about to, and Oliver's like, can I have one? Doesn't tell him anything except that. And the Lord comes back and he says, cast your mind upon the night when you cried out to me in prayer. Did I not speak peace unto your soul? What greater witness needs you than from heaven? I I call that moment an Oliver moment. And it's one that the Lord's inviting anybody and everybody to have. Because it's sort of a fantastical story. You're like, I sometimes can't believe I say with a straight face that I believe it, you know? Like I'm telling my kids, and I just say, I sound like a Netflix show. And then the angel came. And then, you know, you're kind of like, it's sort of like, and it's almost like the Lord set up this plan because he's like, I know, I knew when the book was going to come forth. And I knew what you people were going to be like. And so he provides like this, like little cute, this great system, right? Of like these witnesses who said, no, like I really saw them. I'll put my name in every copy of the book, print it in there. We heard the voice. Sometimes people argue about the witnesses and they say, they say, um, maybe they thought they saw them. You know, maybe that's, they were kind of under this delusion. All three of them and then four of them, you know, and then eight of them. This delusion. <laughs> and so, and, and, uh, and, and so um, someone asked um, Martin Harris about it later when he was in the Salt Lake Valley. It was a, a priest quorum. And they said, um, did you, oh, I got to read it too right from him because you, you won't believe me. <laughs> this is how you talk to a priest quorum. This is why you don't want to bring the priest quorum to this class. You want to bring it to another one because like you would say stuff like this is so good. He says to the priests, just as plain as you see that chopping block that had an axe, I saw the plates. And sooner than I would deny it, I would lay my head on that chopping block and let you chop it off. That's a little gruesome, but that's cool for the (laughs) 16-year-olds. You know? Someone said to him, really, really? And he's like, gentlemen, do you see my hand? Are you sure you see it? (laughs) Are your eyes playing a trick on you or something? No? Well, as sure as you see my hand, I did see the angel and the plates. This copy of the Book of Mormon right here, this is John Whitmer's who kind of walked away a little bit, um, you know. Well, a lot of them walked away, you remember. And sometimes people are like, don't tell that part of the story. And I'm like, tell that part first. That makes the story so much radder when they all bail. You know, because then I'm not going to tell you the John Wimmer part. I'm going to tell you um, Thomas B. Marsh. When Thomas B. Marsh, who was cor- president of the Quorum of the Twelve, was excommunicated. And so was, um, who did he go to? I can't remember if it was day of it. Oh, to David Whitmer. And David was excommunicated. Thomas B. Marsh went to David and said to him like, Okay, tell me if you really saw the angel. And if you really, I mean, now we're both on the outside. And so like, you know, come on, (laughs) fill me in, brother. They both are like mad at Joseph. This is when you expose him for a fraud. And his two friends talking with each other. Come on, man. Come on. Really? Really? This is what David says. He said this. He says, as surely as there's a God in heaven, I saw the angel. According to my testimony that's written in that book. He says, then how did you not stand by Joseph? And he says, when Joseph received the Book of Mormon and brought it forth, he was filled with the Holy Ghost, but I now consider him fallen. And that's for another day to talk about, you know. But the reality is that all of them are like, (laughs) as much as I disagree with whatever else is going on, I promise you, like I, I saw them. I saw them. Now, David, who I love so much because, I mean, Martin, who I love so much because remember in section 19, the Lord actually calls him a wicked man. (laughs) He's like, oh, you just are like, and that doesn't mean what it means today. If you say that to somebody today, they're like offended for 12 years. 
you know? You just say, this is my friend Chris. He's barely just coming back to the faith because I called him wicked 12 years ago, right? It's just different language, but he's just like, Martin, you're so, like, you love your stuff so much and, and you're so, like, wishy-washy and you break your promises and stuff like that. And, and I, I'm like, oh, no. Every time I hear that description, I'm like, ha, <laughs> You know? He says, but then... It's so funny that even after all the losing of the pages and the wishy-washiness, God still asks him to be a witness of the book. And even on the day of the showing, remember they're all praying? And he's like, it's me. I'm messing it up. I'll leave. And he walks away and the, other, or the others like have the angel come, you know, and everything. And Joseph walks over and he says, you still can too. Don't you love that Joseph's the one who says it? Because he authentically knows that. He was like, oh, I know this God. He gives second chances. Should we try again? You know, and you just see Moroni like winking behind a tree. He's like, he learned it. Because <laughs> Joseph kept hearing that, should we try again? That's like, the, that's what he heard over and over and over and again in his life from the Lord. Should we try again? <laughs> Section three, you love that one. The, the section of the Doctrine and Covenants that proves to me that Joseph is a prophet is three. The first one he prints where he gets chewed out. I love that one. He's just like, and my first revelation as prophet will be, Joseph, shall we try again? <laughs> and then Martin comes and, and he sees it. And later, you know, he falls out of favor with him. This up here is uh, Martin Harris's rebaptism certificate. On September 17th, 1870. It says on it, Martin Harris, born May 18th, 1783, at this place, 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 bapt, rebaptized the 17th of September, 1870, by Edward Stevenson, confirmed by Orson Pratt and others. Then at the bottom it says, he was first baptized by Oliver Cowdery in 1830. Should we try again? Yep, you can try again. It's, this is going to be fine. This is Hiram Page's document right here where someone wanted to arrest him. It's just a messy story. It's so fun. But it leaves that hero spot wide open. Sometimes you'll read the story and you'll think, really? To this group of people? In a place like this? You know, I, a couple of weeks ago, I went to um, the prison up in Draper and I shared the story of Jacob and the ladder and the promises and the dream and some of those same stories from the Book of Mormon because you see that in the pages of the Book of Mormon over and over again too. It's not just the existence of the book, you know. The existence of the book is fascinating because it came from somewhere. Remember President Hinckley said, you can like heft it in your hands. It came from somewhere. Someone produced 531 pages. You know, it's not a question of whether Joseph, whether God did it through Joseph. That's how we should speak, right? But the question is, how did it get produced? You know, that's the question. It's not whether it got produced, because it's here. It's just, here we go. One, two, <laughs> like, on your phone. Oh, it's here. Someone wrote the words down. They didn't just appear out of nowhere. And if they did, that'd be a better story. Where'd that book come from? It just appeared. <laughs> you know? But instead, it's cooler, it's cooler, because it's, it's like, oh, we just, we, you know, we spilled stuff on the paper, and we like wrote, and I couldn't smell. And, like, it's funner. You know? And that they produced not just 531 pages, not just half a million words, but half a million, like, good words. Like, they're good. Like, people read it again and again and again. You know? They're, like, good. But I love this line. Don't worry, I'm coming back to Martin. In just a second, I'm coming back to the prison. Y'all think I left the prison. I didn't. <laughs> this, is a, this is a man who was, he was writing about the, the subject of Christianity at large. But he said this, Though argument does not create conviction. You can't, proof doesn't create conviction or belief. But the lack of it destroys belief. Right? So even though we can't say any of this proves, their witnesses don't prove it, 
But the lack of any evidence whatsoever would destroy belief. He goes on and says this, What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument doesn't create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. So it's almost as if with the Book of Mormon, which is kind of the proof of the ministry of Joseph and all the things that... There's no proof that it was actually real, but there's just enough evidence that leaves space. It leaves a messy space for you and me to kind of struggle and like push and move through. And remember, God does his best work in those places. The places of like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure, maybe uh, mistakes and uh. It's like it's just set up for this awesome, fertile climate for faith to grow. You know, it's just like God likes it. So we're telling this kind of story at the prison, you know, the story of God from the beginning. And we talk about how, you know, it's shocking and surprising where and when and to who God shows up. And I had just said that God shows up to Jacob out in the middle of the desert in this broken and, and like down in the dirts kind of place. And this guy in the, back row raised his, in the back row raised his hand and he says, just like God shows up here in this place. And I said, sir, there are probably people who drive by on the freeway every day. It would not believe me if I told you that God shows up in this place. And he said, well, they should believe in a God like that. Because that's exactly what he's like. That's what this story is teaching us, what his heart and his character are, are like. Y'all, I named this class Gold from the Dirt to trick you into thinking it was about the Book of Mormon. But it's really about human souls. That is the work of God in this. The Book of Mormon kind of shows you how it's all working, but really the work of the restoration is God taking dirty souls and refining them into something beautiful and pure as gold. That is what we're watching for. That's what we're celebrating this year and, and always, hopefully. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Okay, you want to stop that?